Okay, you, Dylan, your dad, right now, backyard, game a horse, who wins, who loses? Oh my God. I'm gonna say me, but, but, I'm, I'm gonna say me, but last time the three of us played horse, Dylan did beat us. <laughs> Dylan, Dylan won. That was Ron Harper Jr. And this is On the Bench with Mike Hall. That's me. Ron Harper Jr. is the star men's basketball player at Rutgers. Of course, you recognize his name because of his famous father. Ron Harper was a longtime guard in the NBA who won five different NBA championships, including three with the galactically famous 1990s Chicago Bulls. Just before his playing career ended, he became a father to a son whom he gave the same name. Ron Jr. is now in his fourth year with the Scarlet Knights and is playing his best yet. This season in particular was notable as he helped his team beat the number one ranked Purdue Boilermakers back in December. But it wasn't just that he beat them, giving Rutgers their first ever win over a number one team. It was how he did it. He hit a half court buzzer beater to win the game. The now legendary Harper Heave. So of course, my first thing I wanted to talk to him about was the shot of his life. I remember so much and I forget so much at the same time. Like coming out the huddle, I just remember telling the guys to give me the ball. And then when he scored, I was like, all right, it's go time. And I got the ball and I looked up at the clock and I was like, I think it was 3.4 seconds. And I was like, get some dribbles off. And I got to my spot and I remember shooting the ball and I shot it and it like, it looked good. And I, I feel like I didn't even see it go in. Like I kind of just like expected it to go in. And then everybody just started going crazy, running on the court. and then. Yeah, the rest is history. But after I put the shot up, I kind of don't remember seeing it go in. I just remember, like, the reaction. <laughs> How would you describe the reaction? A phenomenal. Oh, oh, my God. That's, that's exactly what I came back to college basketball for, to play in front of fans, to have those type of games, uh, have those type of moments. And it was just something that's special, and that's something I always remember. When did the celebration end? The celebration ended. Uh, th the next day I was doing some podcast interviews, but uh, after practice was over, I was kind of, like, done. I was trying to focus on the next game, seeing Hall, and they had just gotten a big win themselves. So the next day was when I really tried to like dial it down a little bit and just like I try to move on and worry about the future. Yeah, but that night you didn't like go to bed at 10 30. No, I didn't go to bed at 10 30. <laughs> I definitely didn't. <laughs> Me and my teammates, we went out and had fun and enjoyed ourselves for a little bit. You know, we, we got a couple round of applause, round of applause throughout the night. And it was just it's just one of those nice full circle nights that you enjoy with your teammates. What was the wildest part of the celebration? Oh, so many. I, I, I remember watching the video and like my girlfriend was like the first person to run on the court and like I'm throwing my headband in the air and she's like running onto the court and then Jalen Miller is running from the bench and they just collided and they're pretty good friends and Jalen just like she, he toppled, he like ran her over almost. <laughs> And like he's like covering up, trying to make sure she's not getting stepped on, and they're just on the ground. <laughs> but I didn't realize until after, and then I saw a video, and they like they full on ran into each other, full speed, full collision, <laughs> and they're just on the ground, out trying to help each other up. What did she say about it? She was like, "Oh my!" She was like, "I almost got to you first if it wasn't for Jalen." <laughs> she was like, "If you didn't just run me over, I would have I would have been front and center to hug you first. <laughs> That's pretty great. And she didn't break up with you afterwards, I'm assuming. No, no, no. Okay, no. good, good. Yeah. That collision, I could see. That was your guy who ran into me, Ron. <laughs> yep. Uh, coolest person who reached out to you after the shot? Oh, I feel like the Magic Johnson tweet was pretty cool. You know, I haven't really talked to Magic Johnson since I've been with my dad when I was, like, in middle school at, like, NBA events. So to see him put that tweet up and, like, mention my name, that, that was pretty cool. Like, he's a Hall of Famer, the best point guard of all time. So, that was, it was, like, shocking. It was, it was crazy. I assume – have you ever hit a half-court shot before in a game? No, that was my first one ever. Do you practice it? Uh, not even, but, like, before <laughs> – at, at the end of every shoot-around, we, we kind of shoot half-court shots, and it's, like, the first one to make it, it's, like, we're done. And it goes in, like – it goes, like, seniority. So, like, the oldest guy's first. And I, I made, like, I think I made almost 10 this season out of the games that we had. And I go third, so I'm always up there third. But I, I make them at a pretty high clip, and I kind of just shoot it like a regular jump shot. But that's, like, the that's like the extent of practice that I get from those type of shots. I don't I don't ever, like, go in the gym and just start shooting half-court shots. Do you remember what Pykel said to you afterwards? 
don't know. I, I have no idea what Pike said. I don't think I saw Pike until we got back into the locker room <laughs> and then we threw a tub of water on him and <laughs> he's just jumping up and down and he's just telling us we made history. I think that was the first thing he told all of us, like we made history. I don't, I think he just grabbed me, pulled me to the side and he was just like, wow. And just like <laughs> disbelief, like it's, it was just crazy. What a cool moment, man. I mean, yeah. like you said, that's why you come back to college. That's, <clears throat> that's something you'll never forget the rest of your life. Um, so, so here's sort of a bigger picture question about this season. How is it you guys are so good, you can beat the number one team in the country, but you also lost to Lafayette this year? How'd that mm -hmm. happen? Uh, I feel like it was an accumulation of a bunch of things, you know. Uh, Coach Hobbs always talks about the power of preparation, and our, our preparation for that game was poor. Uh, I feel like we kind of gave the game the cold shoulder, and we kind of just expected to show up and win. And when you have that kind of mindset, uh, you're not going to win many games. Especially in this league, you won't win any game showing up to a basketball game like that. But I feel like that served us as a wake up call and it was well needed for this team. You know, the sense of urgency. Uh, I saw dudes motivated to work a lot harder after that. And ever since that game and the, the UMass game, the Paul game, uh, I've kind of been seeing a different team out there, a different team in practice every day. Uh, I feel like our mindset has just gotten so much better. And that we, we recognize that we have bumps in the road, but there's still so much season left and there's so many opportunities to be great. So we're just trying to salvage all of that. Yeah, and, and maybe for all we know, you don't beat Purdue if you don't have mm -hmm. that wake-up call you exactly. know, a few weeks earlier. Um, let me talk to you about one of your teammates. Mm -hmm. His first name is Cliff. How the hell do you say his last name? Omori, I think. Okay. You can quote me on that. I'm pretty confident that's how you say it. Because oh, it's been a huge debacle for the last two years. Oh, he's he, he's telling dudes how to say his name. He, he keeps feeling like people are saying his name wrong. So, yeah, I didn't know how to say his name until like this year. So it's not just you guys. It's right. not just fans. It's me, too. Well, that's that's the thing. Like, there's nothing. If there's one thing I want to do as a broadcaster, it's always say the name right. Like, I can get a stat wrong, and I'm okay with that more so than getting a name wrong. I always want to get names right. And we called him Omarui, and then we were told that he was like, no, no, you're saying it wrong. It's a Mori, and we were like, "Oh, okay." So we called it a Mori, and then we were told, "No, no, he says it's a Morie now." And we we're like, "Wait, what?" He goes, "Yeah, it's a Morie." A Morie, oh, yeah, okay. I think and, that's what it is. And then he he took. They had him say it into a microphone after we were told it's Omarui. He wants it to be Omarui, and we listened to him say his own name, and it was a Mori. And we were like, "What is what is going on?" Yeah, Cliff doesn't know what he wants. It's, it's just so confusing because. Before Cliff, we had a teammate, Eugene, with the same last name, and he was Eugene Omarie. And that's kind of like, whenever I see Cliff's last name, that's kind of what I think of first. And that's probably what you guys thought of first, too, when, like, the first game you called for him. But, yeah, Cliff, Cliff doesn't know what he wants. I mean, he, if he's going to say his last name a million different ways, he can't say it to anybody else. Right. Well, I've decided I'm just going to call him Cliff <laughs> the rest of the time. He's just Cliff. Yep. There's no confusion on that one. Exactly. You can pronounce that. You can just sound that out real easy. All right, speaking of names, so I have, a, I have a life theory. I want to run past you, Ron. All right. So the back of your jersey says Harper Jr., right? Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't. Here's okay. why. And, and it's not you. This is everyone who's a junior, basically has junior. The back of the jersey is for your last name. Your last name is not Harper Jr. Yeah. You are Ron Jr. Harper is your last name. You're a junior because if your name was Bob, you wouldn't be a junior. But you're a Ron Jr., Harper mm -hmm. is your last name. Tell me why I'm crazy. I think you're correct. Like, you know, that's not that's not the last name. Like the last name is like your family's last name. Like the junior part and like the third and then the rest after that, those are all suffixes. So yeah, you're definitely right. I definitely think that you're correct on that, but I don't think it'll ever change. I feel like we're too deep. I feel like every team in the country has somebody with junior or the third or something like that attached to their name. A hundred percent. Yeah, it's everywhere. You're right. Literally mm -hmm. every team has at least someone. G give me the best thing and the worst thing about being a junior. Uh, the best thing about being a junior is that, especially with my dad, he has a lot of great advice. He can tell me a lot of stories and I laugh a lot. And he just has a lot of great things to share with me about his journey and uh, what he went through. The worst thing about it is kind of like the same thing, you know, the expectations that come with Carrying a name, you know, something I struggled with early on, but it's definitely something I've gotten better with. But the best part, it, it overshadows the worst by a lot. You know, I've learned how to deal with the worst of it, and I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job with it. See, I've always assumed the worst part would be if anyone calls out and you're with dad, hey, Ron, no, no, Ron Harper. And you're both like, yes, what? I'm right here. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, I would never look when we were when I was younger, but now when me and him are out in public and someone says like, "Hey, Ron," we're just both like turning our head and we're like we're waiting for them to identify which one they're talking to. But you two aren't the only ballers. Um, Dylan is your brother, mm -hmm. and he's got some game. Give me a little scouting report. How's his game compared to yours? Uh, I, I feel like me and my little brother are like polar opposites. Yeah, and I feel like you know we're, we're kind of similar in size. He's shooting up there. He's like six four, six five. He's a lefty. I'm a righty. I'm a forward. He's a he's a guard. He's a he's a, he's a, like a true point guard, combo guard. And the way we score is different. The way we defend is different. And the way we just do everything. But at the end of the day, we're both ballers. And I kind of grew up like watching him play like that. So he's never changed the style that he plays. No matter how tall he is, he wants to be a guard. And I feel like that's a common trend with a lot of kids these days. But he's just he's relentless. You know, he has every move in that bag of his. He can break you down off the dribble. He can, he's big enough to where he can shoot over you, and he can definitely take you to the basket, and he'll surprise you with his athleticism. So he's going to be a great player. Yeah. Sounds like uh, you need to start your go to Rutgers recruiting pitch. <laughs> Don't worry. I started a long time ago. <laughs> have you have you tried to be like, no, 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 I want you to come here, or are you sort of like, I'm going to stay out of it. You do whatever yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll hint at it every once in a while, but I try to like ease him into it. At, at the end of the day, I respect his decision <laughs> because. I know going through the decision-making process, how it felt with my dad's old college being on the table for me to go to. And I kind of didn't want to go there because like he was so great over there that I felt like the expectations would be too great. So I, I kind of know what happens with Dylan. It's all like a big like waterfall trickle down effect with me, my dad and my little brother. And I all just like, he just keeps piling up and he's kind of like the end recipient of it. But he, at the end of the day, I know he's going to make the right choice. He has so many good people in his corner, giving him good advice that wherever he ends up, I know he'll be happy. And that's what's most important to me. Okay. You, Dylan, your dad right now, mm -hmm. backyard game of horse, who wins, who loses? Oh my God. I'm going to say me, but, but, I'm going to say me, but last time the three of us played horse, Dylan did beat us. <laughs> Dylan Dylan won. Dylan won. The last time we played horse was uh, April 2020, my dad's driveway. My dad has one of those rinky-dink uh, basketball hoops with the with the bad backboard. So you're just throwing anything at the backboard and it's going in. I don't like playing horse like that. But those two, they'll play horse like that all day. So uh, I'm pretty sure I, I got eliminated first and then, him, I, I, they were playing for like, they had to be like 30 minutes and it was getting so competitive. They were getting like so heated, amped up and then Dylan ended up winning. And Dylan would have been so mad if I came out here and you asked that question and I didn't tell the story because we still talk <laughs> about it today. Like if we're at dinner or like after the game, we'd be like, dad, who won in horse last time was three played? And then we're just like, you got it, bro. You got it. <laughs> How's your dad handle losing to you guys? Oh, he hated it. When, I remember when I first started like being able to compete with my dad and like one on one and stuff like that. We would go to like Lifetime Fitness in, in Montville, New Jersey, and we we would just be playing, and I and I'd be winning by like two or maybe one, and he'd be like, oh, "I can't play no more." Like my back, my knee, and every every day was a new body part. So I don't think he really wanted to play anymore. But <laughs> I don't think he wants to play Dylan anymore either. He he used to play Dylan all the time, but I think he's just gonna take a back seat. And see if there's any other challenges that uh, are going to step up. That's that's smart, right? Because yeah. he's already proven himself, right? Five mm -hmm. titles in the pros. He played most famously with MJ, Scotty, Rodman, the amazing 1990s Bulls. What story does he tell you the most about that specific time with those players in Chicago? The story he tells me most is like the Breakfast Club with Michael Jordan and how he would have guys at his house preseason, postseason, and just trying to get him ready. And they they would, like, wake up at, like, 5 a.m., eat breakfast, and they just spend, like, the majority of the day working out, working out, and just getting better. And that's why they were that good on the court. And that's why they knew exactly where each other were at every time on the court. They just had such great chemistry because they worked towards it. And Michael Jordan was such a devoted leader that he didn't care if he had the house 50 guys and get them all in a workout at the same time. He was going to do it. He would knock at your door if you were waking up late. But yeah, that's the, that's the best story my dad tells me because it just shows like the true devotion that that group had and especially MJ. And it just goes to show when you have a great leader, dudes are going to follow you. And, you know, yeah. my dad and the rest of the supporting cast for that team, you know, they just kind of they kind of went with it. They followed his lead and, and they got the ultimate result from that. They got they got a lot of championships to show. Yeah. So they would do that every day. I'm not sure like every day, but like I think they would go like weeks where they would like just stay at his house and just do that every day. <laughs> and then and you know the maybe they'd have an, maybe they'd have an off day and they go out or hang out or something but 
you know, it, it was definitely rewarding. He, he, he says it was a great time, even though it was hard. But, you know, he tells me that's the type of stuff that builds champions. Yeah. Uh, what's the best memorabilia you have from your dad's playing days? Oh, I have so much stuff. Uh, I have from his playing days. One, I have his jersey with a signature on it. I have a game worn Julius Irving jersey with a oh. signature on it. Uh, a Kobe one with his signature on it. At the house, we got a Michael Jordan one with the with the signature. It, he just has like, it's crazy. From his playing days, he's met so many great players, great connections in every single sport. You know, in his basement, there, there's like a box, a bunch of just like it's just filled with memorabilia. And it's like, it's like, there's way too much of it to hang it up on a wall. And it's just signed game worn jerseys, like exclusively. Like Barry Sanders is in there, Barry oh. Bonds. It, it crosses every sport. I mean, there's some hockey jerseys in there. But yeah, it, the memorabilia is crazy with him. I would give a week's salary just to look through that box and just it's to spend insane. 10 minutes whipping through it and be like, oh man, that'd be cool. Yeah, that box is that box is crazy. That box is probably worth a lot of money, but you know, he, <laughs> yeah. he loves he he loves that kind of stuff. Did you watch any of the last dance with your dad? Yeah, I it was during quarantine. So when it was coming out, we had already seen it like a month prior because he, he had all the episodes on his iPad. So ah. I kind of got I got to see it like I got to see it like a month before everybody else. But it, it was it was fun though, because he would get like an episode a day and then we go over there and watch an episode. And then we like we want to see more. And then you watch another one the next day, and it just keeps going on. And it was just it was great to see. It was hilarious. It was funny. It was exactly it was everything I expected it to be. That was that must have been amazing for you because like the whole country was watching that. And not only are you watching that as a fan of entertainment and basketball, but your pops is in mm -hmm. it. That must have been wild. Yeah, it was crazy just watching his whole journey. You can kind of like see his whole journey throughout there. You know, it got it got his battles with MJ from when he was on the Cavs and stuff. Right. And, then, and then he got that iconic interview <laughs> where he where he uh, gives off a little bit of a uh, of a statement on what he thought should have should have been the call in the last play. Uh, it was just crazy. And then you see him come to the Bulls and, you know, what they just did was amazing. And. The, the last dance only shows a portion of it. They have so many more stories that they could tell. You know, being a championship team of that caliber, you just every day could be a story. They, yeah. There could be there could be seasons on seasons worth of the last dance. Yeah. Uh, y you wouldn't dare debate your dad on who was better, MJ or LeBron, would you? No, I'd never do that. Uh, I'm an MJ guy myself, so. There you go. That's because you're you know, right. But I just feel like it's generations. Like Le LeBron will always be the goat of this generation. MJ was the, the goat of the last. But it's just so hard to compare the two, you know. It's just a, like with every sport. The game evolves, you know. The skill level is going to evolve for years to go on. I'm sure 50 years down the line, we'll see somebody else who everybody's calling the goat and debating against those guys. But okay. at the end of the day, you just appreciate greatness while you can see it. Agreed. You shouldn't be hating either of their games. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, they're so different. You know, LeBron's been doing it for so long. His longevity mm -hmm. is just, it's, it's not, it's not fair. It's not comparable. They didn't have the, that type of medicine. They didn't have the, the nutrition and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. When Jordan was playing, he didn't have the chance to do that. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. You can't really uh, compare them. Okay. Uh, in your time in the big 10, it's been a while. Who's the hardest guy that you've had to guard? In just the Big Ten? Mm, the hardest guy I've had to guard in the Big Ten is hands down James Palmer. My oh. freshman my freshman year. Oh my goodness. He was it was like a it was like a nightmare to be honest. Yeah. Cause like <clears throat> we played him, we played him at the at the rack when it was called the rack back then. And he he had like his little 20, 22, but I barely guarded him. Like I think Montez Mathis got the got the garden for most of the game. And then we played him in the big 10 tournament and they had like six scholarship dudes, a walk on playing. Cause like they had dudes <laughs> suspended dudes hurt out for the season. And they're, they're 14th in the big 10 and we're 10. Uh, maybe 12 or 30. I don't remember exactly, but I just remember I got that assignment because the, the lineup changed and it was just like a clinic. Oh my God. It was like, he had 34 by the end of the night and it was just like he would take one dribble at the three-point line and he next thing you know he's doing a reverse layup and his like strides he just he had such a pro game and we were throwing like three four dudes at him and that's how you know you're having uh, like a good night like when you see different dudes starting to line up on you 
And he was just having one of those nights. And then he went out the next day and he did the same thing to Maryland. And then he went out the next day and they lost, but he also had like 20 plus points. So that's definitely the hardest player I've had to guard since I was here. That's a good name. That's a good yeah. pull because that won't, you know, uh, he was a great player, but won't be necessarily looked at as like a Luca Garza or as a mm-hmm. Cassius Winston or somebody who made like a bigger name, but he was, he was tough, man. He I was like serious. That. He was real deal. <laughs> How about the flip side? Who is the hardest guy for you to score against when they were guarding you? Hmm. That's a, a lot of names come to mind, you know. A lot of a lot of these bigger forwards that I've had to match up against, like Keegan Murray's, the Lamar Stevens, and Malik Hall from Michigan State. Those, those probably those three guys right there. They had they play similar on defense. They're real lengthy, real strong. And me, I'm trying to use my size to get to my spots to get the best advantage. But, you know, those guys, they have just as much size, some strength. And, you know, they just they make life real hard to score on them. Yeah. You once described your game. Uh, someone asked, how do you describe the way you play on the court? The word you described it with was funny. Hmm. What do you mean by that? It's just funny, you know. Uh, because I feel like I can do a lot of things that people don't expect me to do. You know, I feel like I'm a lot more athletic than people give me credit for. And then I, I can surprise you sometimes, you know, I, I hit a really deep three, make a really tough layup. And it's just funny to me. Like, I so I can remember, like, freshman, sophomore year being at the foul line and dudes, like, he can't shoot foul shots and shooting threes and coaches, like, not a shooter. So that's that's what I mean by funny. Like, it's uh, I feel like I play like a real unorthodox game. Like I can do everything. And a lot of guards are, or a lot of dudes aren't really used to guarding that. And, yeah. you know, I feel like that's what I mean by when I say funny. I like it. All right, Ron, uh, we're almost done, but not yet. Before you go, we're going to do before you go. Four questions unrelated to anything at all. You ready? All right, I'm ready. Number one, you went to a famous high school. What is it like at Don Bosco? Oh, it's a brotherhood. It's a lot of laughs, a lot of memories, a great education, a great environment. And it's definitely somewhere I I would send my son to. Uh, Don Bosco Prep is just, I built so many relationships from there. And I I talked to so many of my friends that I graduated with. Even the dudes that I don't talk to every day, you know, when we interact, it's always like, it's all love. It's just such a brotherhood. And at Bosco, it's such a great culture. Like from the coaches, to the teachers, to the faculty, uh, all those people really wish the best for you. And it's just a great place, and I love it there. And I'm actually going to go back tonight to go see my little brother play, so it's funny that you asked me. Nice. Well, there have been some great athletes who've come from Don Bosco, right? Mm-hmm. Some great athletes. You know, I, I got the pleasure of watching a lot of them. You know, one name that comes to mind being a Rutgers guy is Leontay Carew. Mm-hmm. You know, me and Leontay, we talk every, all the time. We have a great relationship. And he's back at Bosco, you know working with the kids, working for the next generation. And he's just a, such a great dude. And he sets so many records here at Rutgers and he played at the next level. So he's everything that a Bosco kid should look up to and a Rutgers dude. That's great. All right, number two. Uh, in the past, you have described your head coach as having the ability to get hyper. Mm-hmm. What is the most hyper you've ever seen <laughs> Steve Michael get? Oh, the most hyper. There's so many stories I could tell on here, but I think he'd, he'd be so mad if I did. But the most <laughs> hyper, the most hyper he's ever been was definitely after we beat Purdue. He was, he, we threw the water on him, and I'm, I'm thinking he's gonna be like mad and upset. Like he's drenched, just like lathered in, in ice cold water. Like he just did the ice bucket challenge, and he's jumping up and down, screaming, dancing, and it's. That's definitely the most hyper I see him. He was so excited and he was just, he was living in the moment. That's something Coach Pago does great. I love that. Uh, All right, number three, toughest Big Ten arena to play in. Mackey Arena, hands down. Every day of the week, you know, I'll I'll take that to the grave. Mackey Arena is the hardest place to play. You know, I just, I remember so many things about Mackey Arena. I remember exactly how it looks, where the students are, how they hold like a countdown, but like, the most frustrating thing to do at Mackey Arena is shoot foul shots. Because, like, at the foul line, I try to go up there, and I'm like, it's just me and the rim. It's just me and the rim and the ball. I'm trying to zone everything else. And you just see, like, hands behind the backboard. <laughs> and, like, you're trying to concentrate. And, like, you just see a bunch of waving fingers. And it's just the most frustrating thing because it's just – you're just trying to relax. But, like, it's just so much movement that it's, like, so hard to focus. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's just a crazy place. 
I think most people would say that too. I mean, it's always, yeah. there've been some great ones. Like when Indiana's good, when Illinois is good, like when Michigan state's good, their arenas are impossible. But Mackey is so consistently said yeah. the toughest one. I, I, I'm not surprised you said that. All right. The fourth and final one, when your playing career is over, whenever that is, what are you going to do? I want to broadcast, you know, that's what I kind of went to school for. You know, I'm, I'm a journalism, I'm a journalism and media studies major with a specialty in sports journalism. So uh, I'd like to get into broadcasting, maybe coaching after that. But I always want to stay around the game. I feel like I'm a pretty good basketball mind. And I just love to talk about basketball. Like I could sit here for hours. I could do a play-by-play. -play. I could analyze a game after. And it's just I just always want to be around basketball. So that's that's what I would see myself doing after. Ron, I know a guy in the sports casting industry. I'm yeah. Just saying, I know some people. <laughs> yes, sir. I got to get in touch. If, if you want me to fire Robbie Hummel so you can take over for him, I'm ready to do that. <laughs> no, you can't do Robbie like that. Oh, Robbie's a good guy, man. <laughs> he is. He is. Maybe one day we'll be sharing a set, you, me, and Hummel. Sound like a plan? Maybe one day. Sounds like a plan for sure. <laughs> I love it. Thanks for your time, Ron. Thank you guys for having me, Mike. That was Ron Harper Jr. My thanks to him for joining me, and my thanks to you for listening. From the Big Ten Network in Chicago, I'm Mike Hall. We'll see you next time.